presented by Linsec. Today we will be discussing how to properly plan for outdoor video surveillance projects. My name is David Martin and I will be your moderator today. First I'd like to introduce you to Linsec. Since 1998, Linsec has been a trusted security and surveillance partner with experience in the USA and around the world. Linsec has a background of working with many types of industries and we help customers develop enterprise solutions for complex physical security projects. We've developed a powerful security platform called Perspective Video Management Software. This enterprise CMS streams and captures IP security of IP security video and incorporates video analytics, access control, RFID, and more into the software. Uh, before we get started, I'm going to take a moment to uh, go over some housekeeping rules. Um, we'll be taking questions during the webinar, so you can enter your questions in the GoToWebinar panel. Um, it's on the bottom uh, of that panel. We'll collect those uh, during the presentation and answer questions at the end of the event. We'll present poll questions during the event, and we encourage your participation in answering the questions when they are presented. At the end of the webinar, we'll present a survey for attendees. We ask for you to answer a few quick questions to help us better serve you in future webinar events. And if you are interested in a completion certificate for today's webinar, indicate your wishes on the survey, and we will make sure you get that certificate. We'll follow up in a few days after the, the webinar with certificates, answers to questions, and a copy of today's presentation. Um, we also record these webinars, post them to our website, and we'll provide you a link to the webinar uh, video archive. Linsec sponsors these webinars monthly, and we cover a variety of safety and physical security information, and often we bring in uh, guest speakers. So check back with us uh, to find out what's coming up next in our Step in Security webinar series. So today's physical security expert is Keith Harris, Marketing Manager at Linset. Keith has skill working with law enforcement and government customers selling video security products. This includes training law enforcement personnel on video surveillance investigations and techniques. Keith spent over 20 years in the broadcast news industry as a video journalist and newsroom assignment manager. He has several years experience working in the video security industry specifically. So, uh, hi Keith, and uh, please welcome Keith uh, um, to the webinar. Hi, thanks David, appreciate it. Thanks everybody for joining us today. Today we're going to go over some information about how to properly plan for outdoor video surveillance projects. Outdoor projects, as most of you probably know, very greatly, and that's a little bit of an understatement just to say that alone. Projects can be as simple as hanging cameras on the outside of the building, with all cabling internal to that building that houses network equipment. Um, however, projects also get very complex quickly when you're looking at in outdoor environments. Uh, we'll tackle some of the issues like dealing with environmental concerns, such as considering unique environments in various projects. When you consider some sites need remote cameras across acres of property, sometimes in multiple remote locations, you have to start thinking about how and where to mount the cameras. Installers have to find a way to power the camera, transmit data, and overcome the obstacles. Um, we need to determine also how to choose the right camera and lens for the job. This can mean calculating focal length, length on a lens or even uh, pixels per foot in order to determine the maximum, uh, maximize the definition needed uh, to achieve a desired quality. Uh, many jobs will have obstacles to overcome, such as limited or no infrastructure uh, to support equipment. Uh, it's part of, part of the job of the uh, project manager in those situations to determine how to get video and data back to the head end equipment that's recording the video. We'll look at dealing with wired transmission through conduit or transmitting uh, data wirelessly, sometimes over great distances. Uh, when considering sometimes extreme conditions for deploying equipment, a project manager may need to deploy edge devices that are ruggedized or hardened for the elements. So then the question comes is where do you start? Um, I always like to start at the beginning. Uh, so we start with a site survey. Talk is cheap, uh, 
and you can do uh, talk a lot about a camera project, but seeing the site location can speak volumes about the scope. Pre-planning your project is helpful in order to understand priorities, but you have to remember also that work is subjective. Walking a site project gets you more information about the scope of the site. Uh, you'll understand distances, line of sight challenges, um, installation obstacles uh, much better after you get a chance to walk the site. Um, these details are, are these are details that you can't get just by looking at a map or a layout of, of a site. So the big picture is important, but success is in the details. Now we'll come to our first poll question. When you take a look at the poll question here, uh, what are the two most important factors in determining an outdoor camera position? So I'm showing the, uh, the screen here that gives you an opportunity to vote on that. Um, the answers uh, of choice are mounting, position, and field of view, power and transmission path, vandal protection, um, and weatherproof rated equipment. Of course, there's many variables that come into play when you're looking at a camera position. Uh, we're going to go over all of these in the presentation. However, I'd say all, that not all the variables are equal. So if you have, have a chance to vote there, well, please go ahead and do so. getting close here on uh, giving uh, people a chance to vote. We'll wrap up this poll and show you what the results are. All right, we're pretty close to being done. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, show the results that we have. The results that we show here are, I would say, 50% say mounting position and field of view, 25% say power and transmission path, and 25% say vandal protection and weatherproof uh, uh, rating. Now, um, I would say this is probably a little bit of a, I'd say, a trick question, um, because in my determination, uh, the answer, correct answer, is number two, power and transmission path. If you don't have those two things, then uh, the other things fall away. You really have to get those two things na nailed down um, and determine uh, how you're going to power your equipment in a remote location and how you're going to transmit the data back to be uh, recorded. So those, that's my choice is number two uh, for that. Yeah, and I would agree with you there, Keith, as well. Power and transmission are extremely important uh, in considering um, your camera placement. And honestly, it's something that, that most people overlook when it comes to um, your, your camera position. Uh, a lot of end users don't even consider it when they're saying, hey, I want to put a camera there. They don't think about uh, those two very important factors that have to be in place before you can even use a position. So moving forward to take a look at remote camera locations, when you're designing an outdoor project, you'll obviously have a lot of questions, and it's your job to think of everything. Understanding the environment is important. Um, you can start with tools like Google Earth or uh, a calculator that I like uh, from IPVM. Google Earth is a good tool for getting rough measurements, uh, distances, so to speak. Uh, when you're estimating cable runs, target distance for lens focal length calculation, or even wireless transmission data, Google Earth will give you a rough idea of the distances you're working with. Now, for security insiders, the camera calculator from IP Video Market uh, or IPVM is a good tool to consider. It's only available for subscribed members. Uh, but the tool is powerful and it could help you develop a thorough site design. Uh, it allows you to place cameras on a map, visualize the camera field of view, plan pixels per foot, and choose the right camera for the project. I also recommend taking pictures while you're on site uh, doing your site survey. This will help you with your planning when you get back to the office. Uh, it'll provide you with a better idea of what the environment is like, uh, making it easier to communicate information with the installation team. Um, and you don't want to rely 
spy on your memory here uh, about the site location since the project may not be installed for many months after the uh, original site plan. Let's take a look at a few different type of installation uh, scenarios. Um, these can, obviously you can have projects of many types, but uh, these three different types have distinct characteristics. Uh, number one is no infrastructure. Uh, number two is limited infrastructure. And number three is solid infrastructure. So if we take a look at number one, our scenario is, is no infrastructure. Uh, this can be a, a site where there are no buildings, maybe no power, probably rural in nature. Um, and so, you know, a, a site like a, a, an oil rig location or, or uh, uh, an energy substation might be a good site uh, that would give you that type of scenario. Um, many questions come up. You might ask, where do you want to deploy the camera? How are you going to mount it? How are you going to power it? Where will the video be stored? Is video being transmitted back to a remote location? And the questions go on and on. Because you have limited infrastructure, you may not have an existing position to mount the camera. So that may require installing a new pole to mount the camera. In these scenarios, uh, you may have to consider a solar solution with a battery bank. Solar is not always equal in, in all areas, and deciding on the battery, battery capacity requires careful planning. At these locations, access to the network is tricky. In rural environments, you may have to plan to transmit data back via a cellular data network. Not all cellular data networks are created equal. The more rural the site, the less likely it will be to have a solid cellular data signal. Bandwidth for video transmission is also at a premium. Uh, so companies like to make big claims, but they're notorious for restricting data streams for those who use a lot of bandwidth. And video, of course, is a heavy bandwidth use item. Uh, just because you calculate for a maximum data throughput doesn't mean you'll achieve uh, that in a real life scenario. Cellular data companies may throttle down your bandwidth use without your knowledge at any given point in time. Planning for local recording on an edge device or in a rugged server may be appropriate, though it could be more expensive. Um, in certain situations, it may be your best solution to go with. If you're recording locally, you don't have to stream your data continuously. You may choose to store your data locally and only stream data when you have access to the live or recorded video. In a limited infrastructure scenario, um, you have unfinished buildings, perhaps with no climate control, probably have access to power, um, and you could be in a rural or even an urban environment. Um, you're improving your installation environment when you have limited uh, um, infrastructure, uh, but you may still have obstacles to overcome. Even in an urban park, you may not have much infrastructure to work with. Let's take that park pavilion on the upper right as an example. Uh, the goal there may be to keep an eye on vandals. Uh, the park pavilion is open on all sides. You don't have secure climate controlled environments and that's very important. Um, the pavilion makes a great place to mount the cameras and you probably have access to electricity in order to power the cameras, but you may not have network access close by to transmit data back to the head end. In these scenarios, you may have to use edge camera storage to find a way to enclose a video server capture and record the data. And when you put your video server in an unprotected environment, you have to find a way to protect it. And you might need to enclose it in a NEMA enclosure to protect it from moisture, dust, and damage. In scenario three, uh, we improve significantly. We have a solid infrastructure here. Uh, finished buildings on site, reasonably close distances um, to your camera locations improve your scenario greatly. This could be an office building parking lot, for example. Uh, you definitely have power in close proximity to the camera location. And that provides you with your best case scenario for installation, though you may still face some challenges. Hang your cam hanging your cameras and IP devices on the building uh, is not overly difficult because you can easily connect to power and network inside the building. When you move to camera positions, um, uh, when you move your camera positions away from the building, you have to consider a few things, including power and transmission path. Mounting cameras on a light pole in the parking lot seems like a 
logical choice. You'll want to make sure you check for power and consider how you get your video back to the head end. If you have conduit with Ethernet cable running to the pole, you may be able to use that as your transmission path. Uh, make sure you consider your cable distance and check existing cable for continuity or determine how you're going to run a uh, new Ethernet cable through existing conduit. If you're using power over Ethernet to power the camera, you need to be less than 100 meters in cable length from the PoE switch. And this distance is uh, 328 feet. So you'll need, if you get greater than that in distance for your cable run, you'll need a mid-span injector or a PoE injector to boost power along the, uh, the transmission path. And if you have to add Ethernet cable uh, to reach a camera or conduit, that can be pretty expensive. Uh, and that would require trenching, maybe through existing concrete. Um, when you transmit wirelessly, uh, that helps you to avoid trenching but then you need to consider adding uh, transmitters and receivers into the scenario, uh, perhaps using a network bridge to connect your camera to the network. When you're doing your site survey, um, take a look at the poles as possible places to map your cameras. When you have an existing pole, uh, consider what your field of view might be from that camera position. Does it survey the target area required? Are there obstacles that block your field of view? If your pole position is not ideal, you may have to add a new pole for camera fit equipment or consider another existing pole if it's available. That, uh, bringing a new pole in may require bringing in a subcontractor to set the pole, provide proper power, and uh, a data transmission path from the new pole. You'll also want to consider your proper mounting hardware, and that may require some pre-planning. Um, your, uh, your camera, uh, may come with the proper hardware or it may not. You may have to uh, order that uh, additionally to the camera. And uh, that could be a special bracket for mounting specific cameras to the pole. The camera hardware may uh, may not include pole straps. Those are stainless steel straps. You see the, that in the uh, picture right here on the uh, um, left-hand side. Those stainless steel traps secure the camera to the pole. When you're mounting to the exterior of a building or to a pole, you may need a cherry picker to accomplish the installation. You need to consider that during pre-planning because that's very helpful to help streamline the installation. Don't assume the installer can use a ladder to install a camera or a NEMA enclosure 20, 25 feet up a pole. Safety and ease of installation uh, will, will be an important factor there. Also, when you're working around power lines, Remember to make sure you look up and live. Those are important words to remember. Um, you certainly don't want to get in a situation where, where you're dealing with electricity uh, in a close-by scenario. Um, make sure your, uh, your cherry picker operator is properly trained in safe use uh, of the equipment so that they don't get into uh, uh, scenarios. You don't want to wind up being a, a cherry picker fail uh, on the Internet. That's not a good way to go viral. Remote camera locations with wired transmission can use uh, existing conduit, or you may have to consider trenching to add new conduit. When you're considering the cost of digging those trench trenches, it could vary greatly depending on the job site. Um, obviously, if you're digging through concrete in a parking lot, it would be significantly harder than digging through topsoil. One resource uh, I checked, uh, including included on the link there, uh, provides a cost estimate uh, of approximately four to eight dollars per linear foot just to dig a 500 foot trench. 500 foot trench. Um, obviously, the, the further you're digging the trench, the lower the cost per linear foot goes. But uh, um, you want to make sure that you're planning that accordingly. And the the link there, uh, if you're using that calculator, that only gives you a rough rough estimate for budgeting. Actual quotes from trenching companies are going to provide a more accurate estimate. When you're looking at uh, uh, poles for your cameras, you want to make sure you're, you're conscious of the number of poles that you that you put on a number of cameras that you put on a pole. I recommend four maximum. Even that may be a lot for a small pole, but uh, you want to be cautious about that. Um, 
using a, uh, uh, a NEMA enclosure with the proper rugged equipment installed is helpful. Uh, that may include a rugged POE switch um, that powers cameras, uh, maybe also uh, power supplies for your IP cameras and for your, your uh, network bridge transmitters. The data uh, from these may be transmitted through a wireless antenna. Uh, you want to make sure that your transmission bandwidth available is able to handle the camera's data output. In other words, if you're using a high megapixel uh, setting on all of the cameras um, and you're pushing that through a network switch and a, a wireless antenna, you want to make sure you don't ex exceed your, your data output um, uh, for you know, whatever equipment that you're choosing. Um, you may have to in, uh, include a, a NEMA enclosure that houses a, a local rugged video server or other equipment. So the size of your enclosure will be dependent on the uh, equipment that needs to be housed inside. I see a couple of people have entered in some questions. We'll get to those answers here uh, in a little while. I just want to make sure that uh, that we're not, not missing anything important in our questions. Um, when you're taking a look at uh, uh, your NEMA enclosure, it's helpful in certain environments, uh, most environments, to make sure that the NEMA enclosure has a fan that helps dissipate moisture and heat and may help uh, with the overall life of installed equipment. Edge recording is a possibility here, uh, and it certainly has its uh, advantages. This would be cameras mounted on a pole that have a recording capability by uh, putting in an SD card. Um, it may work well as a backup tool, but you don't want to cons don't necessarily want to consider that for your sole video storage solution. Getting access to retrieve stored video data from a camera might be difficult if the camera is hanging 20 to 25 feet up the pole. However, some edge storage may be accessible through the network. In that case, edge storage as a backup to video server storage might be quite helpful. Um, some cameras are now capable of accepting up to 128 gigabyte SD cards for local storage. Also, cameras with multi-stream capability might be able to store high-resolution video locally while transmitting a lower-resolution video stream for remote viewing. That's ideal if you have a limited data transmission bandwidth available, uh, such as cellular data transmission. In terms of your, uh, the cable that you're using, you want to make sure that if you're running Ethernet cable outdoors uh, that you're using the right type of cable. Standard Ethernet cable has a thin plastic casing that will deteriorate quickly when exposed to the elements. Um, best results use outdoor Ethernet cables uh, that are placed in conduits uh, or uh, that can be buried a fair distance away from power uh, lines and other sources of electrical interference. You'll see there in the picture um, that of uh, the camera, they have uh, um, Ethernet and coming straight out of the camera with no conduit. I don't necessarily recommend that unless you have the right type of cable. Putting that cable in conduit uh, makes much better sense. Uh, remember to use shield, shielded twisted pair cable if the uh, camera is used outdoors or if the network cable is routed outdoors. Uh, so the shielding protects the transmission line from electromagnetic interference leaking into or out of the cable. Uh, PVC or plastic pipe uh, installed with waterproofing can work as conduit for that cable. A special exterior or direct burial cable cables could be used for outdoor runs. Uh, direct burial Cat5 cable costs more, but it's designed specifically for outdoor use. Both ordinary and direct burial Cat5 cables uh, can attract lightning strikes to some degree, especially those folks uh, down in Florida where lightning strikes are part of daily life. Um, you want to make sure that you're, you're protecting that properly. Simply burying a cable underground does not lessen its affinity for lightning. Cat5 surge protectors should be installed as part of the outdoor Ethernet networks to guard against lightning strikes. You also want to make sure you're using uh, the right PoE uh, power over Ethernet for environmental conditions. Understanding your temperature and power specs uh, for the equipment that you're using. Now we're ready for our second poll question. 
And that question is, why is line of sight important in a wireless transmission? And uh, something to consider there uh, is the line of sight definition is a line of sight transmission is an imaginary line where the transmitting and receiving antenna can be viewed at once. Right. And so the question choices are it's not important as long as the transmitter is within range of the receiver. Transmission data travels in a straight line between the transmitter and receiver. The wireless transmission will have significantly reduced signal strength at the receiver when obstructions are close to the signal path. Still have some votes coming in on that. If you have a chance, uh, vote on the poll. We'll close that off in just a few moments. We have a pretty uh, knowledgeable crew with us today. They uh, did a really good job on guessing the answers here. We have 100% uh, uh, guessing on answer three. Transmission along this line of sight is subject to obstruction by nearby obstacles, even those not directly in the straight line path between the transmitter and receiver. Uh, we'll uh, go over the, the concept here in just a few moments. Um, some people might guess number two there, but the transmission path is actually an ellipsoid wave, not a straight line. So you have to be cautious about uh, um, some obstructions in the path there. So let's take a look at, uh, at wireless transmission here. When we look at uh, line of sight, it's a common misconception. Uh, line of sight refers to the unobstructed path between two points. The wireless transmission uh, may mean that the signal does not have to pass through any objects before it reaches uh, the receiver. Um, however, uh, it's important to remember that wireless transmission move in waves rather than in straight lines. That means objects that may interfere with a wireless uh, signal uh, by simply being too close to a signal path rather than fully obstructing it. Um, in radio uh, technology, the safe zone for line of sight transmission is known as the Fresnel zone. Uh, most people assume visual line of sight is the same as radio, radio frequency line of sight, um, but it's not. Uh, radio frequencies travel in that ellipsoid-shaped area between the access point and the client. Uh, the ellipsoid shape is called the Fresnel zone, shown in the diagram here. We'll take a look at that in a little bit more detail um, and figure out how to calculate for it. Uh, I would not even chance to, to try to do the math on that. Math's not my strong point. That's why I went into journalism and, and not... Uh, um, not a math based. I could have been an architect except for the math. Um, so when you take a look at the Fresnel zone, it's, uh, it's important to note that there's a radius at the midpoint. Um, as your distance between your access point and your client increase, that radius at the midpoint will also increase. So the antenna will need to be placed at a greater height, greater than the midpoint of the radius above any obstruction. Uh, you need to make sure that Fresnel zone is clear of any uh, obstructions between the access point and the client. When you have only 20% obstruction, you start seeing signal loss. A good rule of thumb is not to exceed 40% obstruction, and you'll start to see a significant signal loss above that figure. Obstructions can range from buildings to trees. Even the earth can get in the way of the, the transmission, which is why over significantly long distances, transmission uh, through uh, satellite is, is achieved. Obstructions can range uh, greatly. Uh, it's also uh, worth noting that water absorbs radio waves. So while a tree may be a minimal obstruction, the water on the leaves will absorb the radio waves and have a big impact on signal quality if it's within the Fresnel zone. If we take a look at RF uh, in in an area where uh, equipment is installed. RF is, is uh, standing for radio frequency. 
uh, RF is the rate of oscillation between uh, in a range between uh, 3 kilohertz and 300 gigahertz. That corresponds to a frequency of radio waves and alternating currents which carry radio signals. The RF usually refers to electrical oscillations uh, that can affect your, your transmission. Other access points, cell towers, and other wireless devices can create a noisy RF environment that causes interference in the signal. A good access point will determine automatically how much interference there is and adjust uh, channels or uh, transmission power accordingly. In noisy RF environments, you'll have a limited range and other challenges due to interference. You'll want to survey urban environments for RF interference. Uh, and you can find tools, uh, spectrum analyzers, that will help you measure uh, your site location. Uh, understand that you'll need to probably take multiple measurements. Uh, a measurement on one day may not equal a measurement on another day. So you want to take an average and uh, determine um, which spectrum you want to use or which radio frequency will work best for you. And uh, if you don't have the right equipment for that, you can certainly find contractors who can help you measure your spec, do a spectrum analysis uh, report for you for certain site locations. Uh, determining that RF environment will be helpful in maximizing your, your wireless equipment plan. When it comes to different types of wireless tr transmission, we're going to start uh, by talking about point-to-point -point transmission. Um, that refers to a communications connection between two nodes or endpoints. The term point-to-point -point or P2P relates to fixed wireless data communications for transmission in a multi-gigahertz range. In all cases, uh, P2P transmission expects that a clear line of sight is present and capable of beaming in a fairly tight transmission path between points. A wireless network bridge is a useful type of equipment that uh, you can use for transmitting uh, IP data. Uh, the bridge can extend the network to areas, uh, areas uh, where wire uh, communication can't be achieved. Um, the bridge links between uh, two or more devices uh, using a wireless uh, distribution method. That network device uh, connects multiple network segments, allowing uh, connected IP devices to be added uh, into the main network. If clear line of sight is impossible due to obstructions, network antennas can be configured together to create an antenna hop. And that could potentially, that, that an antenna hop is designed to virtually bend the transmission around obstacles. Uh, another uh, type of feature uh, of advanced P2P transmission is, is MIMO, also called multiple input, multiple output. That's a method for multiplying a capacity of a radio link, um, and it uses multiple transmit and receive antennas to exploit a multipath transmission. MIMO specifically refers to a technique of sending and receiving more than one data signal on the same radio channel at the same time uh, using a technique called uh, multipath propagation. When you're looking at uh, uh, the next type, it's point, wireless point to multipoint transmission, also called P2MP. That's a communication that's accomplished via uh, a one to many connection, providing multiple paths of uh, transmission from a single location to multiple locations. P2MP is typically used in wireless IP transmission via gigahertz radio frequencies. And it may be either single uh, or bidirectional in the type of system that's used. The central ant antenna will broadcast or receive transmission from several antennas. The base station may have a single omnidirectional antenna or multiple sector antennas, uh, which uh, can be used to increase both range and capacity. The picture that you see on the upper right are the sector antennas that you see pointing in four different directions uh, to help increase the range and capacity that are coming in. A technique that's uh, also used in wireless transmission is a wireless mesh network. Uh, shorthand for that is mesh. It's the communication network made up of radio nodes organized in a mesh 
topology. You'll see here in the picture that we have multiple radio nodes located around this urban environment that we have laid out. Mesh often consists of mesh clients, mesh routers, and gateways. Mesh clients are often wireless devices, such, such as IP cameras. The mesh routers forward traffic to and from the gateways. And when you're broadcasting, you're using a coverage uh, of the radio nodes working as a single network called a mesh cloud. Uh, access to the mesh cloud is dependent upon the radio nodes working in harmony with each other to create uh, a radio network. The mesh network is reliable, but it also offers redundancy uh, between the nodes. When one node goes down, the rest of the nodes can still communicate with each other uh, directly or through, or through one or more intermediate nodes. In other words, if a node can't communicate with its neighbor, then it can send it to another neighbor to achieve a, a different path back to the, uh, the head end location. When you're looking at power, uh, it's important to understand where your power is coming from, uh, understand what your quality is uh, going to be like before powering your, your IP cameras and edge devices. You'd be surprised at how many end users don't even consider that when they determine their camera location. Uh, most, uh, most IP devices are operating on DC power, either using 12 volt or 24 volt. There are some uh, situations where AC power is needed to power certain cameras. Um, but uh, all of those will need to get their connection from local AC power uh, using some kind of power adapter that adapts the proper power to the camera. Uh, most IP cameras today operate on power over Ethernet. Uh, you can get uh, from a PoE switch within close proximity. Remember, your PoE distance over Ethernet cable is under 100 meters or 328 feet. Anything further than that in cable distance needs a PoE injector or a mid-span injector to power the equipment. If you're tapping into local power, such as a light pole, don't forget to test your power. Just because the power line is there doesn't mean the power is available. Also, uh, it's important to note that some parking lot light towers may run on a schedule. Your power may not be hot 24-7. It may operate on a dusk to dawn schedule. So you want to make sure that, uh, that you're testing it and, and having good solid power uh, 24 hours a day. You want to make sure you have clean power and that it's free from voltage spikes and drops. Voltage noise is uh, that's outside of the ideal range for the equipment can cause the electronic equipment to perform poorly. Uh, the dirty power can also damage equipment over time or even uh, immediately if there's an incident like a power surge. Using a power conditioner can help filter out voltage noise and minimize uh, damage from power surges. If you're sending power over a lengthy distance, you want to be aware of, of, of voltage drops. Um, there are so many factors that contribute to voltage drop, including cable distance, the gauge of the cable, AC power versus DC power, and more. I have a voltage drop calculator link on the, uh, uh, the page there that uh, you can gain access to. And we'll provide a copy of all of these links to you uh, in the presentation when we send that out after the event. When you're taking a look at uh, uh, running off of battery power, you need to, to take some special plans into consideration. Um, you just consider how you're going to provide power over time. That could be uh, the length of a temporary mission, uh, such as a mobile uh, equipment that might be deployed um, before moving on to a, a new location, or it could be a permanent installation that implements uh, a plan to supply, recharge, and replace batteries for continued operation of cameras. Um, you'll want to consider how many battery amps will be needed to power equipment over the specified time frame. You'll also want to know the, uh, the power draw of the equipment. That could be a combined power draw of multiple cameras, uh, your PoE switch, uh, wireless transmitter. And then you'll need to see what your battery capacity uh, is available that you have. Dividing your battery capacity by the power draw to determine how many hours the equipment will run uh, before a recharge is needed to divide that battery capacity by the power draw. You may have to tie multiple batteries together. Uh, this chart here shows how that works. Um, I can provide more details on that uh, in the, the presentation that we send out after the event. 
when you're taking a look at uh, solar, uh, solar is a standalone solar power system uh, that's independent from any electrical utility. Um, this is a more complex, advanced uh, uh, type of installation that you might need some ex outside expertise with. Um, they can be used most often in remote areas where electricity isn't available or not feasible due to cost. Uh, solar systems are used in conjunction with batteries to collect and store solar energy. Uh, those can be used to power equipment over a longer period of time than batteries alone. During the day, electricity is generated and used uh, to power the equipment and keep the batteries charged. At night and on rainy days, all necessary power is, is provided by uh, what's been stored in the batteries previously. The solar powers capture the solar energy and distribute it to a charge converter before it's stored to the battery, and then it's sent to the equipment requiring power. Uh, solar system voltages range between 12 volts and 48 volts. The operating voltage of a solar panel must be high enough to charge the batteries, so it needs to be greater than just uh, powering the equipment. Uh, the size of the solar array is also uh, can be significant. Depending on the design of the system, it may be, it may be quite significant. Don't expect uh, that type of installation to be mini minimally noticeable. Batteries used in the set system uh, must be protected from the elements and also have the ability to handle the constant charging and discharging of cells. Uh, I definitely recommend using a deep cycle battery designed for constant use. Uh, when you're looking at designing a solar system, and choosing the battery, you want to make sure you take a look at the capacity that's available, the cycle life, amp hour deficiency, self-discharge rate, and more. Installation location uh, does matter. You want to make sure you have a clear view to the south. You can't install your solar panels in places where you have a lot of shade, so a view to the south is important. Um, to get the most from your solar panels, you need them to point in the direction that captures the most sun. Of course, um, if you're in the northern hemisphere, you need to be facing south. If you're in the southern hemisphere, you need to be uh, have your solar panels facing north. And you also want to make sure that you're pointing towards a true north and a true south. That's a little bit different from magnetic north and magnetic south. Uh, when you're using a compass to orient your panels, you need to correct for the difference. And you can uh, search the web and find some information on magnetic declination to find correction for your location that will vary from place to place. Angle uh, is also important. Your tilt as a general rule of thumb should be equal to your latitude plus 15 degrees in the winter or minus 15 degrees in the summer. When you're taking a look at locations, uh, geographic locations, we're going to hone in on the U.S. here, you can obviously uh, expect more sun in Southern California than in Washington. That doesn't mean you can use uh, solar, in you, that you cannot use solar. That doesn't mean that you cannot use solar in less sunny areas. It just may have to adjust your solar panel array or your battery bank to accommodate for your needs. Do your research for your installation location and decide what design best accomplishes your needs to suit the solution deployment. This link I have here is for the U.S. Department of Energy. It's a quick and easy link to uh, get some data regarding solar energy potential for various different areas around the United States. You'll see there that uh, Death Valley gets uh, significantly more watt hours than uh, Seattle does. Let's also take a look at uh, um, layers of security. It's important that, uh, that you take a look at the concentric rings of security to determine um, the amount and complexity of necessary uh, security needed in certain areas. Uh, we're going to use a site here. Uh, I chose uh, this capital of, of Texas. Uh, just pulled a Google image up so that we could use it and kind of uh, survey this this uh, particular concept. When you're looking at uh, um, your secure zone, obviously the areas closest in to the high profile region are going to be secure. You're going to have tighter security there. Security guards may perform ID checks for visitors and require employee badges. 
You may have required bag checks, metal detectors in high profile areas. Uh, security may require canine and foot patrol to keep constant visual surveillance on uh, targeted areas. Um, after 9-11, they even shut down all of the, uh, the internal traffic uh, and, and entrances um, around the, uh, the capital of Texas here. In this zone, you, you may need heavy camera surveillance. And due to the secured, the secured area, uh, live monitoring of cameras makes sense. Also, uh, access uh, control installation uh, may be required for secure assets. So if you've got certain areas that, uh, that are restricted to the public, you may want to have access control on those areas. As you move outward from the building, um, you, you find an area that's, that's called the patrol zone. In this zone, security guards may be on a scheduled foot or vehicle patrol. And all employees in security uh, should be advised in these areas to be aware of surroundings and to be on the lookout for trouble. If you see anything suspicious, say something. Um, in the patrol zone, medium surveillance will be used. Uh, you won't have quite as heavy camera coverage. Um, and the camera coverage won't be as prevalent as you see it in the secure zone. As we move outward uh, to the, one of the outer uh, rings of security here, you have uh, an observation zone. This will be uh, more sporadic and a lighter level of patrolling. Um, employees and security should remain aware, but uh, your awareness is not as intense in their observation as it is in, in uh, inner zones. Uh, surveillance uh, cameras placement will be lighter here. Uh, cameras will watch choke points uh, over a large area to help uh, uh, keep an eye on on traffic as it moves to and from the area. And then you have the outer zone, which is the unsecure zone. That zone may not be patrolled. Employees and security still remain aware of their surroundings, but here you'll find little to no surveillance. Now, when you're looking at choke points, um, you find out a little bit more details here. Choke points are areas where traffic funnels through. Uh, and that could be foot traffic or um, uh, vehicle traffic. These are areas uh, such as driveways, walkways, fence gates, security gates, etc. Your cameras point towards those choke points in order to capture um, a video that provides relevant data uh, about people or vehicles moving into or out of the area. Now we have our, uh, our final uh, poll question here. And the question is, uh, what does, why does distance between camera and target area matter? So we've launched the poll. We're running a little short on time. I'm going to have to zoom through some of the, the last slides that we have here. Um, when you're looking at the uh, choices here, why does the distance between camera and target area matter? The, the distance is used to determine the field of view for the camera. The distance is important in determining the focal length for camera lens, and the distance is important for determining pixels per foot and the resulting clarity of the image produced. Or, number four, all of the above. And we're doing pretty well with that. Uh, um, everybody's uh, guessing all of the above, which is exactly the right answer. If you've been on previous webinars, you've had a preview of some of these uh, fundamentals. Uh, we've discussed field of view, focal length, and pixels per foot. I'm going to skip over some of these slides. Now, this is a, a, a typical idea of a camera field of view. We have a calculator down there that you can gain access to, um, but you're basically looking at distance between the camera and the target area versus the area that you want to see. And so calculating that can help you determine what proper lens you want to use for your camera. And um, you'll want to take a look at the vertical height and the horizontal width of the area desired. Uh, there's a formula for calculating that information, but it's much easier to use the, uh, the online calculator that I've included there.
I'm skipping over a few slides here to make sure we have uh, appropriate time for questions. Um, some of this information is a little bit more on the basic side. Um, when you're taking a look at uh, um, camera capability here, uh, PTZ cameras are popular, um, but they're not as popular as they used to be. A lot of integrators are moving away from them and going towards megapixel cameras or cameras that give you a capability for capturing 100 degree field, 180 or 360 degree field of view. Um, only one in 10 cameras being deployed today are PTZ cameras. Uh, oftentimes you'll find uh, security installers are using multiple megapixel cameras that can cover the same area with less cost. And in addition to that, multiple megapixel cameras can keep surveillance over an entire area instead of leaving areas uncovered while the camera is uh, pointed in a different direction. Now take a look here at pixels per foot. Um, when you're determining pixels per foot, you want to, to see what level of detail you're going to get at certain distances. Um, so that uh, correlates the horizontal pixels that are available, uh, and you divide that by your field of view width to get your pixels per foot. There's a calculator that I've included here as well, and this chart gives you some good ideas. Uh, for example, a 1080p camera um, on a horizontal uh, width has 1920 pixels. So if you're using uh, that particular camera that requires 1080p, you can get uh, 96 feet of horizontal coverage for general detail. When you go down to the high level of detail, you're reducing that to 24 feet. So this will help you determine how many cameras you need in a certain area in order to get the type of resolution and coverage that you need. And uh, taking a look here at crime prevention through environmental design, I'm going to shorten this uh, talk just a little bit. I'm hoping that we have uh, a uh, presentation in the coming months on crime prevention through environmental design. Uh, but your basic concept here uh, when you're talking about uh, crime prevention through environmental design is the way you design your urban area landscape. And um, you're basically uh, using um, an approach to deterring criminal behavior through the way you design the area. And this can be uh, keeping lines, line of sight open for people to have visual uh, clearance uh, from a storefront uh, through to uh, uh, vehicles. You don't want to block off your area from field of view um, because that helps to improve uh, your deterrence of criminal activity. Um, and so you can build entire neighborhoods that limit traffic flow, uh, maximize visibility, and help increase the number of eyes on the street. And part of that means uh, that potential offenders feel scrutiny and limitations on their escape routes. Uh, you can see here also lighting is a big help. Um, lighting in uh, parking garages and in parking lots help to improve your, your capability of uh, preventing crime. So that's it. We're going to jump right into questions. We just have a few moments for questions here. Um, and uh, David, it looks like we have a few questions that have come in here. Uh, let me see what we have. Uh, if you would uh, um, take what you have, and then I'll, uh, I'll take a look at questions that have come in from our attendees. Sure, I'll, I'll try to be uh, brief so we can get to them all. Um, a general question here is uh, asking about providing links for the uh, calculators and resources that you uh, mentioned throughout your presentation. So those are included there, and um, I think Keith, you will be sending um, that presentation out with all of those uh, links as well. Right, we'll also, be sending that out. Okay, thank you. thanks. Also, um, there's another one here that's uh, mentioning POE. How do I know what type of POE I need? So there's a couple things about, um, and, and Keith, I'm just going to kind of jump in here um, uh, to move quickly through these, so just stop me at any point. <laughs> sure. Um, but but um, a couple things uh, to point out there. Um, you know, you have standard POE and you've got uh, POE um, plus, and 
each provides a uh, different amount of power or uh, watts of DC power to a device. Um, generally, um, POE, uh, standard POE is going to be more than enough uh, power for most um, devices. When you when you um, start utilizing uh, PTZ cameras is when you really want to uh, be cognizant of the power that is needed to run that PTZ because you're not only transmitting video, utilizing video data or powering video data, you're also doing uh, standard data with the control of the camera. So that's where I would watch out for that uh, uh, mostly is with um, uh, PTZ cameras and using POE Plus to uh, gain more power. And we've got, there's a question here about, um, oh, this is a good question, uh, the, the frequency range. Uh, what is the, the best frequency range I should consider for uh, a wireless transmission that you, you would kind of hit on there? Um, so, you know, I think most common uh, that people are aware of would be the 2.4 to 5 point gig range. Um, you're also going to see uh, quite frequently the 900 and the 1.2 gigahertz. Um, and then, you know, some uh, frequencies are um, restricted that you can uh, go to the FCC site and, and see their graph of available frequencies. But um, most commonly, um, it's used, uh, for instance, in Wi-Fi and, and most radios that we're using is going to be 5.8 or, or 2.4. And um, a good rule of thumb here uh, to consider uh, each frequency is the higher the frequency, the uh, more penetrating power that it will have. So if you have some minor obstacles, you may want to consider this. Um, the lower the frequency, the greater the spread. Uh, Keith kind of touched on that when he was uh, talking about the Fresnel zone. I apologize for, for being, uh, if I'm going too quickly here. No, no, no problem. Uh, one thing that was uh, brought up uh, uh, by Stephen, he indicates that 100 meters Ethernet length is not just a factor in PoE, but it's also a factor in data transmission. That's absolutely true. Uh, I didn't really point that out in my presentation. I felt like I had so much to go over and, and so little time to present it here so that I had to cut some things out. But that's a good point. Um, your data transmission uh, has a limit uh, in terms of uh, the length it can transmit over Ethernet cable, uh, as does your power. So you, you need to be conscientious, conscientious of both and using the POE injector or a mid-span uh, when you have runs that are longer than 328 feet is, is very important. It not only helps to boost the power, it also helps, helps to boost the data. Uh, we will have this, uh, uh, all of these uh, questions and answers available um, and we'll email those out to you along with the uh, copy of the presentation. Do I have time for one more question? Uh, you had a really good point that you brought up earlier, David, about about the uh, uh, the types of uh, um, the, the new types of technology that's out there for wireless transmission. Yeah, thank you. I was, I was going to try to touch on that. Um, so, uh, what are the capabilities of wireless and radios in terms of bandwidth? Is a, is a common topic um, discussed. And traditionally, um, today with the current radios, you can see you can gain bandwidth. 80 megabytes to 100 megabytes pretty easily and pretty cheaply with most most brands of uh, radios that are out there, which generally um, is more than enough bandwidth to handle four to five two megapixel cameras on one radio. And as all technology, this uh, technology is quickly um, developing, and um, I've heard through the grapevine that soon. And what I mean soon, probably by the end of the year, if not sooner, you're going to see what is called wireless fiber. That's going to be a radio that can handle a uh, gigabit. So um, when you do have, it, it, it's always best for wired when you can wire, but you also uh, can feel comfortable that when you do have a remote area and it's just not possible to wire, um, you can feel comfortable using wireless radios um, to give you reliability on your video data transmissions. 
Okay, uh, we, there may be one or two questions we didn't have a chance to answer. We'll include those in the email out to uh, to all the attendees and make sure you have that available. But that's that's about all the time we have here. David, do you have any uh, wrap up that you need to do? No, uh, Keith, you've got our uh, contact information here. So uh, all of you, please feel free to contact me. That is my cell number. Um, it, don't hesitate at all. Con call me anytime or shoot me a note uh, on email. I'm, I'm pretty uh, responsive, and you know, at a minimum, I'll follow up with you within 24 hours. But most most times, it'll be within an hour. So yeah. don't hesitate to reach out to me for any other questions besides what Keith has touched on, and you know, review those other webinars uh, on the on the um, the webinar archive. Lots of good information there. All right. Thanks, everybody, for attending today. We appreciate your time, and uh, we'll have this webinar posted up to our website in the next couple of days. Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. All right. Thanks.